All right, so let's whip around and get a selfie. So I'm on my way back after about well, almost two hours of hiking. I, I think it's been, I'm out about an hour, 45 minutes, but I'm no way I'm gonna get back before dark because uh, I just like, you know, you wanna keep going, you wanna keep going, you wanna keep going. And uh, cause you're just seeing, you know, mother nature at her finest. But uh, at some point you just gotta call it a day. But I didn't wanna make a, another, uh, this be my Camp Lejeune video, what, what life was like there as a platoon sergeant. And, uh, and I'm just gonna bounce around from story to story because there's you know, no way I can get them time sequenced properly in my head. But, uh, and I've got them, I'll put them up on my website eventually. So let's, let's whip around and let you enjoy Mother Nature while I talk. If you ever watch this video, you'll get some, these are good stories. <clears throat> All right, so, <laughs> so I arrived at Camp Lejeune and uh, Courthouse Bay, I was gonna be a combat engineer, Marine Corps. And uh, never in my wildest dreams did I think they would make me the platoon sergeant. Of course, they call it platoon leader, because at that time I was just a, a lance corporal, but that outranked everybody that was there. And uh, so I'm like, well, what does that entail, you know? Up until that point, I was mainly a, just a college student. And of course, I've been through basic training and serving, you know, in the reserves on the weekends. And back then there was no money. I was in the Clinton years. And uh, so we just kind of cleaned our rifles on the weekends. <laughs> and, that was, I, and occasionally went out and blew stuff up, and that was fun. Did enjoy that. But a lot of times, you know, they, they'd make us just put the dynamite on the ground. And uh, there was a lot of stories there. That'll be before another video. And uh, so anyway, so I get to Courthouse Bay, and uh, they're going to make platoon sorry. Well, the first thing, you know, I had to learn was how to march troops. I mean, that's an art in and of itself. Uh, you know, because when you when you say left face, you know, and you're making a right face, you know, for example, simple little stuff like that. Forward, arch, your left, your left, your left, right, left. Why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> you know, we we had a, a couple of guys knew some cadences, and I learned a few. You know, I got on the uh, computer back then. I even had my. Uh, and on the internet and I pulled up some cadences and you know so we had a lot of fun and I taught them guys a lot of maneuvers that the other platoons didn't know how to do like uh, I had the uh, what I called the drill instructor parade rest and that's where you would you would you come to a stop do a left face and then hit a parade rest you know and and so you know you make up your own stuff uh, uh, to to the rear and there was another, you know, this is a sequence you can do as a platoon sergeant that I really enjoyed. You just, you, you got three squads, right? So, first squad to the rear, march. Second squad to the rear, march. Third squad to the rear, march. And then you can just repeat that sequence. And uh, so it looks pretty cool because you, you you basically broke the formation up into three squads. And you can you can wait a while and march like that. And then, you know, turn them around and, and uh, bring them back, you know. And of course you got the obliques, left oblique, march, right oblique, march, and that's just a quarter turn to the left, quarter turn to the right for you civilians watching this. And uh, so there's just a ton of ton of stuff you can you can have fun with. Uh, well, actually, I forgot the drill instructor parade rest was everybody would assume a pose. So, you know, some of them would, would do peace, you know, up in front of them. Some of them would just put their hands down and tuck their head in, you know. So everybody, so it looked really, really ridiculous. We, you got to have some fun, you know. But the thing was about Camp Lejeune was I had to march these idiots everywhere. You weren't allowed to just walk to your next class or, you know, even if you're going to chow, you got to march. And uh, these guys, I had, there's a lot of people, you know, just like police officers, you get your bad apples. But I guess uh, the, the good Lord, <laughs> he, he wanted to punish me in some kind of way because I had a lot of criminals in my platoon, man. These are, these are men that should not have been in the military, and you definitely don't want them armed with, uh, you know, with, with, with the weaponry that we get in the military. And uh, let's just get into a few of them stories right now. Oh, my gosh. It just, it's kind of like, where to begin? Uh, I guess, you know, let's start with the most horrific one. Uh, that hopefully that'll that'll catch you like a fish on a line and then you're gonna want to hear some of the other stories But I had this guy and I'm gonna name him out because uh, I'm sure nobody can ever find out who he was but His name was Meade and he was a big guy. I bet he was 6'5 and uh, He just thought 
he was the cat's meow, man. He would not take orders, you know, and, that, and that's another thing that I had a real problem with at Camp Lejeune was I had a gunnery sergeant who was going to retire, and uh, all he cared about was just, just keep him out of jail. And when I would report, you know, crazy violations of, you know, them uh, basically disobeying my orders or uh, are, are doing, you know, criminal acts and stuff, well, you, you just handle it. Well, you know, it doesn't take your troops long to understand that they can get away with anything and they're never going to be punished, you know, which made my job, you know, a hundredfold more difficult. So what basically I ended up having to do was manipulate these guys into doing what I needed them to do. And I got, I mean, I actually did pretty good with that. In fact, I was very proud of this. I got a bunch of criminals to set the medium girder record for putting a bridge up going across an obstacle. And uh, how in the well hell I did that, I, I don't remember. And, uh, and I, you know, at that time I had a, my first sergeant, you know, <laughs> he thought, he says, you know, well, I, we'll get to that towards the end. So anyway, Meade, getting back to Meade, he, uh, he would stay in his room, you know, you're supposed to fall out for formation at 5 o'clock in the morning. And uh, that was another thing. If you looked at my platoons, this is, this is how command, you know, just let things down. If you looked at every other platoon, white shirts, red pants, white shirts, green pants, everybody uniform throughout the platoon. My platoon, they didn't give a crap. They got jeans with, with uh, holy jean shorts on. They got the ragged, you know, with, the, with the, the ragged area hanging out. You know, some of them had green shorts on. Some of them had just regular corduroy shorts on. I mean, it was just looked like a, a mob, to be honest, you know. And, and they let them get away with it. And I was like, you know, what, and how in the hell am I supposed to say, hey, you know, uh, you guys need to be uniform and wear red pants and... Uh, so I just kind of went along with it. I said, you know what, if we're going to be, you know, the outcasts of the Marine Corps, let's uh, let's be the dirty dozen, right? Let's have fun with it. If, if i got no command that's going to rein us in, you know, sometimes you got to join <laughs> with, with what's going on. So so I was just, I'd let them get away with all kinds of stuff, you know, because they had no, nothing I was going to be able to do. You know, and of course, I, I can't, let, let's just keep going. So Meade decided... He, he wouldn't come to the formation, and a guy, what happens was they go around and they bang on your doors to wake you up. Now, you'd think you'd set an alarm, but you're supposed to set an alarm, and then if it looks like, you know, you're not moving about, they bang on the door. And so, you know, they, they got so, you know, me, a couple guys in my platoon wouldn't show up, wouldn't show up, because they're hungover. Um, you know, why in the world they had the, uh, the, the, the enlisted club right next to the barracks there? That, that was a bad idea. I never went in. But, uh, so... Me, you know, he wouldn't show up, so they, they banged and banged. So they, then they, they, they actually disciplined the guys banging on the damn doors, which is stupid. And uh, <laughs> so now they're going to, what are they going to do? They're going to bang harder until they get a response. Well, me, you know, he, he didn't want to come out of that room, but they just kept banging and they kept banging louder and louder. So he opened up that door, and, and unfortunately the guy, you know, he was probably, well, probably 5'8 five, five, or so. Uh, and this mead just he just beat the hell out of the guy uh, And then what was the worst part and this is just going to be horrific for you He he took the guy's head and we had those railings that you know go along the, the, the railing because he's on the second floor And he rammed his head right through the railing. luckily it didn't kill him But it did like partially rip one of his ears off. It was blood blood everywhere and to tell you what a what a, a Monster need was he closed the door and went back to bed <laughs> Can you believe that? Oh my God! Well, see, I, and this is this is what I was telling you. I'm out, I'm out playing golf, and uh, so uh, I get back, and uh, well, it, actually, no, that that was in the morning. I'm sorry. Uh, the the MPs came, and while we were out doing uh, physical training, and they took me away, and that was one of the happiest moments for me, because that was a real bad apple in my platoon, and I was I was real happy to see him go. You know, it was a good thing that he did that. Uh, another story was uh, because we were such delinquents, um, a couple guys uh, from another platoon were hollering at guys in my platoon, and uh, that's a bad idea. You know, you don't mess with my platoon. I, these guys, they're crazy. And uh, so this one guy, I guess somehow he got by himself, which he should have never done, and was saying bad things to guys in my platoon. So he was, they were up on the third balcony, and uh, they picked that guy up. 
and just threw him right over the, <laughs> right over the third bucket. And when he hit, I mean, it broke all kinds of things. And I know he, he needed dental surgery and all kinds of stuff. And uh, so when I got back, you know, I'm in, I'm sitting in my my room, and uh, here's a knock on the door, and you know, I got six MPs, and they're coming in, and well, actually, let me back up just a second. My first sergeant came to me, and he says, "Kirk, you're not going to believe what's happened now." And I said, "I said, I said, don't tell me." He goes, "What are you talking about, man?" I said, "Don't tell me anything." I said, "If I don't know anything, I can't tell them the MPs anything." Okay? I said, "I don't want to know." He says, "That's bullshit, man." He says, "You, you gotta, you know, you gotta report this." I said, "Well, are you sure what had what took place? Were you there?" He said, "No." I said, "So you're just basing this on hearsay?" I said, well, "Let them conduct their own doggone investigation. I don't want to be a part of it." I said, "I wasn't there. You weren't there. You know, and don't tell me what what the speculation is, because then I might, you know, have to divulge what the speculation, but what happened was, and uh, let's leave it be." Boy, he didn't like that, but you know. What am I supposed to do? So, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't recall them ever figuring out which of my, my, the troops in my platoon threw that guy over the third balcony. So they went scot-free, you know. Here's another, <laughs> another instance. So I had two guys, uh, they were coming back from Myrtle Beach. And, uh, I, and I, I, I'm not sure who to believe in this saga, but uh, they, you know, and I can just see them doing this. They found a, a house that was under construction. And they were looking for a place to sleep. Now, they, we, I did this a couple of times going to Myrtle Beach at that time. Because you got no money, right? And so what you do is you just kind of... Like, I've slept underneath houses and, you know, find places at Myrtle Beach just to curl up. And, you know, like a homeless person and just spend the night. Uh, I've slept in chairs by swimming pools. Uh, you know, that's... Uh, and then, of course, they roust you out in the morning. You're, you're trespassing. You need to get going. You know, okay, fine. You know, whatever. But, uh... So, you know, it's, it's definitely possible. They said they were just sleeping there, and the police came uh, for, for trespassing and busted them. Well, the, the person or the builder uh, said that they vandalized the place. And they might have, you know, I don't know. And uh, so I, I, t I told them, I said, well, you know, um, I got my car. I said, I can drive you to the, because, uh, you know, they had to show up in some bum crazy county with, nothing but hicks you know if a hick for a judge and you know how that that ruling is going to come down they're going to they're going to come down hard on my marines you know so i asked the gunner sergeant i said look what do you want to do about this shouldn't we get them some sort of legal representation he says you take care of it i said i don't know anything about the law what are you talking about what am i supposed to do for these guys he says you handle it i don't give a crap what you do he says but they better come back and there better be charges dropped he says, that's all I got to say about it. Go take care of it. I'm thinking, oh my God, what the hell am I supposed to do? So, you know, when, when we got to the courthouse, I told my guys, I said, now, you know, why don't you uh, just plead not guilty and ask for, you know, a, a lawyer for representation? Well, how much would a lawyer cost? I said, I don't know. I said, I imagine it'd be pretty doggone expensive. Will you represent us? What the hell, the hell am I supposed to represent you? I <laughs> I don't know anything. So, so I get in there before this hick judge, you know. I could barely understand him because of the southern accent. And, uh, you know, he's saying, well, how, do we, how are we going to make this right? And I said, well, Your Honor, I said, I, and, and I'm thinking in my mind, what the hell do you do at this point? I said, I said how much were the damages? Well, we're looking at $1,200 back then. That's the early 80s. That's a crap load of money. That's, that's, that's these guys pay probably for a whole year almost. And uh, he says, $1,200. And I, I said, well, um, I said, if they pay for the damages, can we get all charges dropped? And, uh, and the judge, he just looked at me, and I could see him thinking about it. And uh, he says, well, okay, I'll go along with that. So I, I said, well, let me talk to my, my Marines here and, and see what they want to do. And uh, so I took him out in the hallway, and we discussed it. And I said, "Look, I, I said I, I don't, you know, I said I said I bet the, the damages, you know, they were probably six hundred dollars. If there were any damages, who knows? And uh, but that guy, you know, he's he's making money on that deal for sure. I, that's my opinion. But uh, so then they said, "Yeah, yeah, we'll take it, man. We'll take it. He's going to drop the charges." I said, "Yeah, they're going to drop the charges." I said, "But do you really want to spend, you know, the next year paying for this? 
we don't care man as long as they drop the charges okay fine whatever you know money will buy you freedom that's for doggone sure so that's uh that's another story and we, i got him off and i got back and the gunnery sergeant was happy and by the way i never saw that gunnery sergeant except when there was a huge problem like that you know he was no, he was no help to me at all ever the whole time i was there uh well you know let's let's jump around to uh to the uh the, the final day <laughs> okay now as, as a leader it's a lonely place to be especially in the military you really can't fraternize with the troops it's just because they think they you, that you're they're your buddy right and uh if you if, you know because if you hang out with them and then they they want to get away with even more because hey man aren't we friends you know what do you care that I, you know, did this or I did that or whatever? You know, why are you asking me to do that? I thought we were friends, you know, so you can't do that. So it's kind of, kind of really made my stay at Courthouse Bay uh, pretty, well, that's where the golf came in. That's why I just got away every day and didn't, didn't want to be around them. Um, but the uh, the last couple of days, you know, I decided, well, uh, actually what happened was I, I twisted my ankle. And uh, my first sergeant had been giving me so much crap for so long about how I handle the platoon and how, you know, I, I did everything. And I, I was had my sick pass. And I said, well, you know, I thought, well, hell, this is easy street, man. I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick back and just take it easy. So I said, yeah, I said, why don't you just take over, man? You can march them around. You deal with everything. I said, I'm just going to, I'm just going to chill here. You, you can't do that. What are you talking about, man? I, I, I'm, I can barely walk. And uh, he says, he says, well, I, you, no, man, that ain't right. He says, all right. He says, I tell you what, I'll do it. Oh my God, the guy, <laughs> his name was, his name was Vince. So he comes, kept crawling back to me a week later. Kirk, man, you got to take back over. You got to do something, man. He says, this is, you can't just sit in here and claim that your ankle is here doing this, that, and the other. And I swear, I don't remember whether I, I helped him out or not. I think I didn't. I think I just let him flounder in the breeze. No, that's not true because I was marching him at the end and that's another story but uh so yeah i did take back over and and uh command the platoon but uh anyway so getting to the last day uh, i decided i'd join them at the uh, e-club and uh we got in there and they'd never seen me party down you know it's the first for them so we were we were all having a good time and they're slapping me yeah man hey he did pretty good platoon sergeant you know you you're uh, you're all right man we never knew that you were you could drink and of course back then i was a pool shark too so i got on the pool table and i was running the racks and doing all kinds of you know crazy pool shots and like man you're a hell of a pool shot where have you been this whole time i said well you know i just didn't want to be in here and doing this type of stuff and uh i don't remember exactly what happened i think i spilt my beer it was on a woman marine and boy she was a big woman and uh, so, <laughs> you remember that the song, the boys are back in town and we just fell about the place. Well, that was what happened. So me and her got into a brawl. And uh, so this is when, you know, you know, this is when I knew women in combat <laughs> was, was just a fine idea. But uh, so we were, I mean, we were throwing down. I think she threw me over top of the pool table and uh, furniture was breaking. And the next thing I know, the whole place just, just, everybody was fighting. It was crazy. And uh, so, I mean, fists were flying, you know, bottles flying. And luckily, you know, nobody got killed. Nobody, uh, you know, I'm sure people got hurt. But, uh, you know, there was no major injuries, thank God. But anyway, so the couple guys from my platoon looking out for me, they said, Sarge, we're getting you out of here, man. I don't, because yeah, I guess I, at that point, I, I don't know how me and her got broke up. Uh, maybe some people grabbed her and my guys grabbed me. And they said, let's get, out, get the hell out of here. And so they did. They, they and I was drunk, man. They got me across the street to the to the the squad bay, and I mean, no sooner did I get to the squad bay than the MPs showed up in mass. <laughs> it, it looked like the the troops around the Capitol building right now, man. And they arrested everybody. My entire platoon went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, they, they just held them overnight and let them out the next day. But uh, I was just so thankful that my guys got me out of there just in time, too. I mean, I actually just sat up on the balcony and watched the MPs arrest everybody. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, maybe I should feel guilty that I caused all that. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it was, it was a fuse ready to be lit. I just was the, uh, the match that did it. That's all. Anyway, I just, I'll stop there. There's some other stories uh, that I could go on. I just don't want the video to get too long. Well, I'll tell one more. That's a good one. So we, we went down to Myrtle Beach, and uh, 
you know, we always you stay too long because you don't want to go back. I mean, you're having so much fun. The girls, they dig the Marines, you know, so you're, you know, I met a few girls down there. It was really great. And, uh, you know, we, we had a, we had rented a hotel room. And so we decided to stay the, the, the last night and we're going to get up super early in the morning, three o'clock to get back by five or whatever it was, two thirty in the morning. What the hell? Why even stay that night? It was stupid. So I'm heading up uh, back to the, the base because you know, we don't want to be late. If you're late, you're AWOL. And uh, that's a big deal. So I'm doing 85, 90 miles an hour going back. Luckily, I didn't get a, you know, didn't run a speed trap, thank God, but I could have killed somebody. And so we got there, and uh, when we when I rolled in, the um, the formations were all lined up. My platoon here, you know, next platoon here, next platoon here. They were getting ready to, to PT, and we, we, we were already in our PT gear. So I came flying in probably, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour, slammed on the brakes, and I was a good driver back then. I slid that car right into a parking space, and we all jumped out, and I ran over to, and the, you know, I, I ran over to the platoon sergeant, or my, my first sergeant, because he was out in front of the formation, and, you know, of course, we did the salute, and I said, I'll take command of the, of the platoon now. And he just looks at me and goes, you asshole. <laughs> so, so, you know, and he fell into the formation with the, with the guide arm in front. And uh, we, you know, left face and uh, we took off for, for PT. And boy, that was a rough PT. Oh, man, where were we all hung over? But I just, at least I didn't get the AWOL. And you know what? I mean, just to tell you how, how lax the discipline was, nobody ever pulled me aside for that stun especially sliding in there with the smoke flying and from the tires you would have thought that you know somebody would take discipline there now that's probably not true when the military today uh you know which is good and bad you know the military it, it changed over time a lot for the worse some for the better and uh we'll get into that in another video but i just wanted to tell some camp lejeune stories they're, they're quite good in in my mind and uh there's more of them, and uh, maybe with the next video, I'll, I'll start there and then move on to, to some other uh, military experiences. All right, you guys uh, have a blessed day. I'm glad that I'm out here enjoying myself. I'm getting a little winded going back. I got whew, another hour and a half. I hope I make it. Uh, I can't stand hiking in the dark. Bye-bye.